If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. In order to find the magnitude and direction of the impulse, we can begin by reminding ourselves of the following fact. The impulse J is equivalent to the change in momentum of the ball. So if we end up finding the change in momentum, then indeed because of this equality we would have the impulse. So we're really going to make it our task to find the change in momentum, and to do that we can create the following table. Now in this table we have the final momentum, the initial momentum, and then the change in momentum which will be determined by subtracting final by initial. And since momentum is a vector quantity we have to make these calculations in both the x and the y direction. The question notes that after the collision the ball is traveling directly upward with a speed of 10 meters per second. Since it's traveling directly upward that means the final momentum in the x direction will actually be zero and the final momentum in the y direction will be positive the mass of the ball times that final velocity in the y direction. In fact the mass of the ball is given as is that magnitude of velocity so we can plug them in. Notice we're calling it positive because it's traveling upward. So let's plug in the mass and that speed. Now for the initial momentum we're going to have values in both the x and the y direction. We're told that the speed initially is 12 meters per second and it's acting at an angle of 35 degrees. Maybe a picture will help to clarify that. We can actually borrow from the picture that's given. So here is that initial velocity vector acting at that angle of 35 degrees. What we need to do is break it into the x and y components. We can see the x component is adjacent to the 12 meters per second, so we know that we can write that as 12 meters per second times the cosine of the 35 degree angle. Notice that it's pointing to the left, so we want to assign a negative value to that velocity. And then the y component is pointing straight down, and it's opposite from the 35 degree angle, so we know that we can label that negative 12 times the sine of 35. So those would be the initial x and y velocities, and we're going to plug them in. Now remember, we're doing momentum, so we're going to have to take those velocities and multiply them by the mass. So again, notice we've multiplied the mass by those velocities. We've excluded units just because we were running out of room. Now the change in momentum, which is really what we're seeking, is the final minus the initial. So we can pick up our calculator and just simply type vertically downward for the x direction, we would have zero minus this quantity here. And then for the y direction, we would have this quantity minus this quantity here. Now, since these two quantities were masses times velocities, the unit, of course, would be kilogram times meters per second on both of them. Now, again, the change in momentum is a vector quantity, so we have to take the x and the y coordinate and actually end up finding the resultant change in momentum, and perhaps we can show that via another picture. Since the x component of the change in momentum was positive, as was the y component, we've pointed the vectors in the positive x and positive y direction, respectively. Of course, we're looking for the resultant change in momentum, which would be that vector right there. We can simply use the Pythagorean theorem to find that value. And when we do that, we can see that the resultant change in momentum is approximately 5.86. And again, the unit of momentum will be kilogram times a meter per second. So this would be the correct answer to part A, the magnitude of the change in momentum. We also want the angle for part B. And of course, we can use the inverse tangent to find that angle, since we have the opposite and adjacent sides labeled. And when you compute that, you should get approximately 59.8 degrees. And that angle you can see from the picture would be measured counterclockwise from the positive x axis. For part c, to find the magnitude of the average force, we can consider the following equation. We have the impulse equaling the average force multiplied by the time interval. We can divide both sides by delta t to solve for the average force. And so all we have to do is take the magnitude of the impulse that we had found and then divide it by the time. Notice the time is given in milliseconds, so we'll have to multiply it by 10 to the minus 3 to convert it into seconds. And when you compute that, you should get roughly 2.93 times 10 to the positive 3 newtons would be the standard unit of force. So that's the correct answer to part C. For part D, all we need to note is that the direction of the average force is going to be the same as the direction of the impulse. And so since we had found the direction of the impulse to be 59.8 degrees from the positive x-axis, that's going to be the same angle or the same direction of the average force. So this would be the correct answer to part D. 
note again that we would be measuring that counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. So in short, the direction of the average force is the same as the direction of the impulse. Thanks for watching the video. If you like to click the thumbs up icon and also subscribe to the channel, you can send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.